So good afternoon, everybody. I wait until everybody is uh, installed, uh, is finds a place in order to start, because it's already two o'clock and we have a, a huge program. <coughs> Okay, so welcome, uh, welcome to everybody. Um, yes, I would like to, would be great to come with uh, good news today uh, for the past three years because we have been waiting impatiently uh, really for the European Commission um, coming up with these proposals to completely revise the EU animal welfare legislation. Uh, because what we have there is outdated standards, not fit, not fair, to billions of animals suffering every day. So cages should be banned, long-distance transport should be outlawed, intensive animal farming should become a thing of the past. The proposals for the animal welfare revision should be published any day now. That is what was foreseen. But unfortunately, they are being blocked at a very high level. But citizens continue to call for the EU to deliver on its promises on animal welfare. So together with 192 MEPs, members of the parliament, 300,000 citizens are requesting now the EU Commissioner for Health, Food Safety and Animal Welfare uh, from 2024 onwards there is still a window of opportunity for change and we need to keep this window open we need to continue to be loud i remain for those who know me i remain optimistic because i know citizens will not change their mind about this anytime soon compassion is growing and the voices of the eu democracy are loud Already in 2016, 94% replied to the EU barometer that it was important to protect the welfare of farmed animals. Today, European citizens' initiative on animal welfare are sprouting like mushrooms and are getting more and more successful. At the same time, science tells us more urgently than ever. We need to treat animals differently if we want to protect also public health and our ecosystems. Also economically speaking, we know that respecting animal welfare has clear benefits. Maintaining the status quo will cost us much more than acting on the citizens' demands. The externalities linked to intensive animal farming are not negligible. Food safety, clean air and water and public health are under direct attack if we do not deliver on animal welfare. Today give us really the opportunity to exchange on our hopes and expectations and of course also on our common concern about the future of animal welfare. Our two first panels will be dedicated to this. So let's continue to push for the proposals to be published. Let's be critical in what is being proposed. Let's act on democratic demand. Let's end animal suffering. Let's leave no animal behind. But today is also about finding hope and inspiration. So we are so pleased to bring together, and I'm so happy to see such a full room, to bring together people who care about animals and who are fighting for them at local, national, European level, or even global levels. So the third part of this conference will be dedicated to a series of wonderful initiatives from around Europe, which are doing their part for a kinder society. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions and the presentations today, and I'm sure it will give us all motivation to continue to raise awareness and fight together wherever we can. Thank you very much. Thank you again for being there.
Hello, dear Tilly. Hello, everybody. Good to have you here. Thank you very much for this passionate introduction. I want to um, say, technically, if you don't know the language that people are speaking, you can use this one. And uh, you can here choose your language and also the volume. So I know we have a lot of uh, guests from different countries. So um, we have here our wonderful interpreters. So uh, don't hesitate to use it. And uh, even sometimes it's a pleasure to hear some, uh, some language that you haven't heard a long time ago. So my name is Anna de parnay grunberg I'm also a Green member. I'm really, really pleased that today, with a lot of colleagues of mine, with Caroline from France, uh, also David is there, from Manuela and from Francisca. Tom is from Austria and he will jump in, I suppose, in a few minutes. And with Tilly, uh, we are uh, chairing together and uh, uh, being here uh, to... Uh, uh, to, to, to make the point in the end of this uh, period of legislation, uh, what is going on with the animal welfare package. And uh, yeah, as we act, and we, we know that as we act with animals is, um, is a measure of empathy. And in those time, I think we all know that empathy is uh, maybe not the, yeah, the, the, the main flavor or the main sense we, we can see out there, uh, outside there, but I think that um, empathy um, and uh, is uh, always a really um, important also in the uh, in the politic and uh, a system that is based on exploitation and on animal on nature on people is not resilient and we want our system to be resilient and so that's so important to our heart but also scientifically that we are acting um, towards more animal uh, protection towards more animal welfare and in our first section we want to a talk about the revision of the animal welfare package in which four files on animal welfare were expected for the end of this uh, term. And last week, uh, our uh, Commissioner Sefcovic announced that the revision of the EU animal transport regulation will be published in December. And after having this inquiry committee for a long time, where Tilly and Thomas were uh, really um, engaged in the proposal for animal transport, is finally now scheduled for December 23. And um, however, it's only file that we are sure that it will come now in the animal welfare package. And so we will have two panels now on the beginning for this event. And we want to dedicate really the want um, to animal transport. Why the second we will uh, be on, on all the other pending um, legislative files that are so important as such. So um, we want to uh, welcome representative uh, uh, of the commission to this panel, but uh, unfortunately no one could make it today. So that's, um, um, that's a little bit sad because we would have, uh, yeah, deserve a look in, in what is happening now and why those really important files are not coming. But for uh, the first, I will introduce uh, the guest I have here and after I can let you um, maybe uh, uh, also step in. So I have Alexander uh, Rabisch, that um, is vegetarian from Austria and expert on animal transport. He gives professional training on live animal transport and was an editor in multiple uh, animal welfare audits. And um, I wish you that we give him uh, applause to welcome him. Good to have you here. On my right side, I have Sylvia Merigi, project leader at Animal Angels. Uh, you are, that's an animal uh, welfare organization from Germany, focusing on the protection of animals during transport. So I welcome you also. And Reineke Hammerlas is a US CEO from, um, of Eurogroup for Animals, a pan-European animal protection organization, convening more than 80 members in the EU and beyond. And uh, you are also vice president of the World Federation for Animals and a member of the Netherlands Committee for the Protection of Animals, used for scientific purpose. Um, it's so good to have you here. Welcome. And just that you know, for organization, we will uh, have an introduction um, question for each of our speaker. And after we will um, open here the room. So if you, if you have an idea what you want to, to ask, um, play, please take some note. We will uh, really um, soon open the room here for discussion because I'm really aware that a lot of people in this room are uh, themselves engaged in animal protection. I'm sure you have really interesting uh, questions. So I will begin uh, with uh, Tom, if you want to take just 
on the fly, and I will have to ask to Alexander or if you want to step in as you want. I got trapped in the rain, as you can see. So I'm still dripping, but uh, that will not keep me off uh, commenting. I mean, what we see here now is very representative. A lot of citizens, a lot of civil society people, a lot of interested people in animal welfare. But what is missing? It's the commission. It's the actual uh, responsible for putting forward new legislation. And guess why they are not here? It would be a very uncomfortable situation for them. Because still in Agri-Committee, just before the summer, Commissioner Kyriakidis promised, and this is on record and this was publicly viewed, promised that she will come with a ready-tailored legislation on animal transport and all four files, by the way, now in September or latest October. And it's really embarrassing uh, to uh, have to realize that promises given by the Commission are, in, at least in regards of animal welfare, uh, not worth a lot. And uh, so also the announcement that this file might come or may come or is announced for December, well, let's see, first of all. And second of all, I mean, we all know that uh, this, especially the legislation on animal transport, it's ready tailored, it's in the draw, it has been checked and balanced, it has gone through the institutions and through the institutional checks. They could have proposed it any day. There's no practical obstacle that, which, which kept them off presenting it. Why do we now get it in December? Well, let me raise my suspicion here. Um, it's due to the fact that we will not be able to finalize it in this mandate. So the next commission can then decide whether they will pick it up or not. But I think they have made the calculation without you people, without citizens, without us because we're going to put enormous pressure on them to take serious what we work on, to take serious what we propose, to take citizens' demands serious, civil society serious. It's going to fire back on them, unfortunately, also towards the elections, I guess. But still, we're committed to work on the file. We will do our best to better the situation wherever we can and however we can, you together with you, as much as we can. So count on us that we will put pressure and count on us that we will not let loose, even though elections may be in between, but we'll be back and you'll be back and the pressure is going to be back. So let's work on it and let's push it forward. Thank you. So Alexander, my first question to you. Um, we have, we have been in this inquiry committee seeing the suffering of, um, of animals, but also on people doing this awful job, transporting animals through all the road in, in all Europe. And um, we had this really in-depth in inquiry committee. Now we are waiting for the file. And um, if I can ask you maybe to give us a sense, if there is one thing that you think you sh we should not let go, what, what is the main regulation that could help animals on the road in Europe? Maybe you can give a, a hint. If, you, if we not wave on one thing, we have to negotiate. What would be the, the strongest element we should keep in the hand? I think one of the strongest elements could be solving the problems with the non-weaned animals, the youngsters who are uh, delivered through all Europe from the um, eastern parts to the south, to Catalonia in Spain. There should be um, a domestic uh, fattening of these animals if there is this need and desire for consumption of, uh, of meat. And they shouldn't be brought available. For example, Austria. Austria exports 35,000 calves to Spain, mm -hmm. but it imports the carcasses of 100,000 calves from the Netherlands, and this traffic must stop. But this is just one of my ideas. No? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, um, I want to come back because you have really a precise um, um, insight in how can vegetarians be better protected also against threats. Maybe you can come back on this because that is in the whole discussion on how to protect animals during transport. 
the point that is coming back always to us. But how can we also protect people that want us to protect the animals? So maybe you can step on this one, because I know you have a, a really um, deep insight on this. Now I have five minutes left for speaking about the major problems yes. in life animal transports. This is a rather short time. Can we have the presentation? Yes, I think everybody can see it. You have to take the phone. No, there isn't. This here? No, there isn't. And... Ah, here it is. Yeah, this here it is. Yeah, here it is. Not in the middle. There, not in the middle. Yeah, okay. And here you can point and you can see the presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I see, so. Okay. so uh, just a short, a few words, why, maybe on the reason why I'm here, maybe. Uh, I'm a veterinarian and I've worked 14 years all together to, with police as an official veterinarian in Kyrenitia doing live animal transport inspections on a weekly basis. After that has phased out, I've joined the NGOs and then I ma we made trainings of veterinary officers and policemen and nowadays the German Bundesländer uh, pay me for coming there to do this um, um, this further education and this is a picture of what you see with German police somewhere near Osnabrück. And we, um, I want to speak about the concerns and about the major concerns. We can speak about loading hates in, in chicken for example, about loading densities in horses. It's impossible uh, that these very large sized horses uh, fit into the granted uh, densities, uh, granted um, squares. Um, on board of the tracks. We can speak about transport durations in spent hands. We have seen a lot of them coming from Holland to Poland for slaughter, but they stayed in the, in the cages for more than 20 hours. We can speak about um, the decisions of the European Court of Justice, which never ever were fulfilled, especially the last one, C383 of 16. But my major concerns as I um, started what is the transport of non weaned suckling calves, the heat stress in transports, the fate of the breeding livestock and the slaughter in third countries. Please, next. Uh, when you look through this picture, you see uh, on the upper uh, row uh, the, the intervals in which uh, uh, non-weaned calves would drink at their mothers. They would drink at least six times within 24 hours, or sometimes very often, more often, so up to 12 <coughs> times per, within uh, 24 hours. In the stable, they usually get uh, the liquid or milk replacer twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. But um, when this happens, they are very hungry before the, um, before the second um, um, drinking um, with milk substitutes or milk replacers. But on the lorry, there are intervals of 19 hours and they uh, get electrolytes on board, but never ever they get milk, milk replacer. So they are in need of proteins. They are not fed. But, uh, but they, are, they only get liquids. Um, and non-weaned calves means that they are depending on um, a support uh, with energy and with proteins uh, in a liquid form. Um, but when you look to this transport uh, and the intervals of 19 hours, that's not all because they come from assembly centers where they spend time there, at least six hours, with electrolyte supply only. And um, the, the, the delivery before, it takes up to eight hours, so uh, there must, could be an interval of 33 hours and more where they do not get sufficient or any, any feeding, any liquid feeding. Next, please. And we have very long distance, distance uh, transports which are covered from Ireland to France, France down to uh, Catalonia in Spain or to Netherlands and from the Baltic states down to Germany to France and further on to uh, Spain. So they on board 19 hours, they spend uh, 24 hours in a um, control post, then they go further another 19 hours and this is repeated once more. So we have uh, very long intervals where these non-weaned calves get, get hardly no or even no uh, um, milk replacer at all. 
Next, please. And you have seen this calf all the time on the left page, and now you see another calf. And if you look to the difference, these, uh, when you um, stop in a, a transport, a truck coming from the Baltics, uh, you can be sure that two or three or even 10, 20 animals looking like the left one are on board. They are de dehydrated. You see the bulbs, the eyes, and the skulls fallen back, fallen inside. Uh, there is no tour, tour god. They need... Uh, they are really dehydrated and they need some liquid infusion after arrival and the more they need antibiotics. And why do they need antibiotics? Because they, they are confronted with a lot of germs, bacteria and viruses uh, during the assemblies and on the assembly center, on the lorry and the incubation period, the period between they, um, they, um, rec they get these um, viruses or germs inside, and the outbreak of disease is up to three weeks. Three weeks later, they might uh, be deceased from, a, um, from germs they have got during transport. Next, please. Uh, yeah. This, this is the problem with the... I have only five, hour, five minutes. Uh, the next problem I have confronted with is the heat stress. Uh, there is enough and sufficient work on agricultural universities or in the in schools where uh, it is shown how our cattle can be protected from the increasing heat we experience in Europe. Uh, but what do we, do we do with our cattle? We don't transport them to the north. We have no uh, exports to Norway, to Finland or to the Nordic states. All of them are going to the south. And uh, uh -huh. now that's a PDF, so the next picture is missing. Uh, yeah, here it is, yeah. You see, this is from Animal Welfare Foundation. At the Turkish border, a, a bull dying out of heat stress, yeah? This might ha happen on a regular basis each year. Um, so, that heat stress and combined with our um, breeding animals. Uh, next, please. You see, uh, what about these... Um, these herds who are exported, which are exported to um, third countries. We have had the history of 150,000 uh, heifers being brought to Turkey, to uh, Algeria, Uz Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Russia, Morocco, and Iran. The, major, uh, the, the, the majority of these countries have hot climates, yeah? and where have they gone? So there would, should be uh, working herds, but there is no records of herd building in these countries at all. In contrary, the U.S. Department of Agriculture states that Turkey, in Turkey the herds and the number of uh, milking cows is decreasing over the last year. And there are published, uh, papers published in Germany, for example, of herds where... Uh, in Uzbekistan, where out of 1,000 heifers, 500 deceased because they stopped eating because the, it's a uh, daily temperature of 40 degrees, then they cannot stand it, they will stop eating. And the next picture is uh, how all these animals uh, experience their death. Regardless if they are uh, animals for slow, uh, being brought to uh, third countries, uh, for slaughter or for further fattening or even for milking. The end will be the slaughter if they survive the climate. Huh? And, the, the, um, and the way they are brought to death is uh, torturous. Huh? It's uh, painful to them. And I've, together with animals, angels, I've been in Morocco and watched how the Bedouins are um, uh, killing their, uh, their uh, animals. Uh, I don't want to leave this panel without saying something positive. The export of Poland, of slaughter horses from uh, Poland to Italy has decreased substantially. Yeah? There are approximately 200 consignments being brought there, and the business has changed. I was three weeks ago, I was at the slaughter plant in Poland, where over the years 6,000 horses are uh, slaughtered. They uh, collected from a distance of no more than eight hours. And the next day already, the next day, their carcasses are brought to a scent with, fridge, uh, with cooled uh, tracks to, uh, to Italy. So there is some improvement. But nevertheless, commission has to do the, uh, its work. Uh, it's obliged to do. do. Thank you.
Yeah, really painful images, but uh, thank you for your um, presentation and also, um, yeah, the, the pressure you're, you're doing in, 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 this, uh, um, in this story because I know you are really um, traveling a lot around the world and looking how horrible exports we still have from the EU to, uh, uh, to non-EU countries. Thank you very much. Uh, we will go now to Sylvia. And uh, Sylvia, I um, would ask you to, uh, to give uh, us our, uh, your impression on animal angels. Um, what are your main um, states that you want to see the EU act for animal transport to protect animals? And uh, uh, what do you expect what legisla the legislation will, will come now? Um, well, Maybe the pointer? If you need that, to go for that. To use this, I'm not really yes, okay. thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, I will talk about these in this short presentation, but let's say that the main request we have been asking since years and years and years is reduce the time of the journeys. That's the main question. And then the second became reduce the number of the animals in trucks. These two, I would say, would solve the impact of the other problems that concern transports anyway because it's well known that there are some risks that you cannot avoid and the longer the transports are, the more animals are crowded in, the worse they become these this problems. So this is the answer yes. <laughs> to your question. And this presentation is the answer to the to your demand uh, to talk about, to give inputs regarding the postponement mm -hmm. of the um, uh, proposals of the revision of the Regulation 1 2005. And the answer will be at the end, but I will say it now also at the beginning, and Tom already said it. The answer is, the main input is to give, to make a lot of pressure until December, because there are at least some main um, problems um, regarding this legislation that must be solved once for all mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah we've been waiting since 15 years so it's time to so we can start with the okay. presentation thank you i'm not really <laughs> able to so to point no no you just you, next is always here yeah. thanks a lot well. great so yeah this is the introduction but we already uh, talked about it, the, postmon the postponement of the legislation, of the revision. And what we NGOs, I'm talking from the point of view of NGOs, what we intend to do is to continue the pressure that we already started. Doesn't work. Because I'm pressing the wrong. Maybe we... To point where? Um, Happy that it doesn't happen to me only. <laughs> yes. Okay, so there. I can do it for you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, as I said, the, the main uh, problem regarding uh, transport is the length. And the EFSA um, said some important um, points in their uh, last opinions. And the, the most important is that after nine and 12 hours, the animals suffer from thirst and from hunger and from the, for the confinement. So nine or 12 should be the, um, the journey time limit instead of the infinite limit that there is now, or let's say the 29 or 24, depending on the animal species. And what we've been doing as animal angels to tackle this point is this year, uh, was to send to the um, agricultural ministries, to the um, MEPs also, to the um, European Commission, uh, to all the relevant persons and institutions, a report on delays, it's called. Uh, it's called the mismatch between reality and documents because we collected a lot of cases where in the papers it seems that the journey time was respected, but in reality it was not, and this is a big point. And another aspect of this journey time issue is the so-called assembly center, hoping where assembly centers are used as uh, destination places, but instead 
they are just used as a, an exception to violate the 24 hours mandatory rest for the animals. So the animals do nine hours instead of 24 and they continue to be hopped from one assembly center to another place or simply to one assembly center and then they end up to the real destination but uh, without respecting the 24 hours. And we presented a complaint this year that was um, closed and um, let's say rejected because openly the European Commission said that um, animals can be transported on maximum three assembly centers and that's uh, legal and that's okay uh, even if we were showing how this 24 hours arrest is totally violated and this is the core of the regulation 1 2005 in the end, the European Commission said also that with the revision, they will solve this problem because they recognize this is a problem, even if they deny from a legal point of view that there is a violation, which is, a, if I can say it, a joke, but this is the reality. And I don't know, there is a video on the right, this little uh, lamb. Um, that's the previous. It's really short. It's a few seconds, but is to is to show what happens during a transport. We found two cases, one after the other, in the Italian roads. Lambs are transported from Romania to South Italy slaughterhouses. We found um, animals sick and suffering. And what we did was to call the police, the veterinarians. Lucas, this lamb, was euthanized, we can see it in the pictures. Petia, the second lamb, uh, lamb uh, in the second picture below, was not euthanized. She didn't have this luck, if we can say, because we found two different veterinarians with the two different views. So the first one recognized that Lucas couldn't have make, made it until the end without suffering too much. The second said that yeah, this lamb should have not been on board that truck, but she was there and he was not um, in the conditions to do euthanasia for her. And it took four hours to, to the authorities to come and to find a solution only for this lamb, because the others also were also in horrible conditions. And um, the legislation um, indicates that in case of unfit animals found during transit, the animals must be separated and taken care of as soon as possible. And this does not happen, uh, never ever. And it's us that we try to alert the authorities and try to make it happen. And these are the times, four hours, a truck blocked with all the other lambs waiting in awful conditions, and this is not feasible. This is why a shorter uh, time, journey time would help to reduce the damages. The next. Next, please. So the second um, issue, thank you, is uh, the number of animals in, uh, in trucks. Um, EFSA proposed to increase space according to allometric formulas and not all for, for the all species of animals, so more research is needed. But at least it's something. What we've been doing this year was to publish and send again to the authorities a video that illustrates technically, from a technical point of view, all the doubts that we collected from the veterinary inspectors and police implementing the legislation. And we wanted also to show visually with videos um, and pictures how the current minimum densities are synonymous with overcrowding, overcrowding, especially for cattle and for sheep, but also for pigs and for horses, for all the animal species. The next one, please. Another uh, issue is the temperature. Uh, also, in this case, EFSA indicated some uh, limits, species specific, how they should be, because actually the uh, rule of the legislation, of the current regulation, um, gives a tolerance of plus and minus five, and in the end, the rule became um, that the limits of temperatures are from zero to 35, when initially were from five to 30. 
and they are not species specific. We see we saw animals suffering already at 30 degrees or even 28 degrees. So like, it's clear that temperature be um, depends also on uh, humidity and depends on the tolerance of the single animal. The next one, please. Of course, this is a core um, request to um, ban the export for um, different reasons. One, because uh, they are very long transports. Two, because we believe that uh, borders and uh, custom procedures are not compatible with live animals. And a recent case that for which we published our press release uh, involved some um, 41 heifers blocked at the uh, Turkish border, again, after years and years we have been working there. They were confined in their truck for 25 days and they started, of course, dying. And nothing was done for this. In the end, the only solution, of course, dictated by um, money interest, was to send them to uh, Iraq. And we can imagine in which condition they, they continued to Iraq when all the people there uh, were already shocked by the conditions of these animals who could, were really not in condition to, to travel again. And the travel to, to Iraq is not a, a short route. So uh, we published also another report, and when we say publish, we, I mean uh, sending to the authorities. Another report uh, with um, the findings of our investigations in uh, Middle East and North African countries and um, in Asian countries. Um, providing pictures and data. Of course, um, there is no animal welfare outside Europe. Also, the one, I mean, animal welfare level in Europe is not the best. So this is the other reason why to run uh, export. So the next one, the, uh, another request we think is really, really important is that the new regulation must define some um, basic sanctions that must be common for all the countries, so there are no differences between the countries, there are no doubts, and, um, and there is um, an harmonious sanctioning system. Animal Angels published and again sent to the authorities a comparative report offering some insights regarding the sanctioning systems of um, all the European uh, the EU member countries. So, Next slide is the, the end, just we have to continue to make pressure, of course, targeting our request on specific, specific uh, demands, and this is what we will continue to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia, and uh, to uh, all of your colleagues. I know it's a lot of work to collect this data, and it's also a lot of work to... Uh, uh, to be really clear which, uh, which kind of cl clear rule you are asking, because I think you see the whole picture of everything, what is so uh, bad for animals, but you are helping us um, because you are looking at the, 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 the best rules we can fight for. So we can have a, a joint um, voice uh, towards uh, here the other political groups, and so we can, we can act jo jointly. So thank you very much for your work. And uh, now uh, we're coming to, to Reinecke, and uh, I know that you're going to, uh, to step in and to uh, make it a little bit uh, more comprehensive how many people are fighting for, uh, for animal uh, welfare and, uh, and specifically for meting, uh, uh, making the, the transport of animal um, yeah, less worse, uh, let it put like that. So please take your floor. Yes, well, I can only say that um, to Yugo for Animals is counting now 95 member organizations in the EU and outside because um, improving animal welfare is a global mission. We can't just do that in the EU, although the EU still likes to present itself as a global leader in animal welfare, but let's see what will happen. Uh, uh, I think the reputation of the EU is at stake, but, but really, you know, I think that uh, one of the strongest arguments we are now seeing, and that's also why it's so great to see you all here, is that EU citizens want this change. So we really represent, um, I would say, 10 million of uh, citizens who are speaking up for animals. So, and I would also like to ask the audience to really uh, do something uh, after this event uh, today, but I will do that later on. 
So you would like me to uh, briefly start? Let, let me have another go at this. Uh, or I ask. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so coming back to um, Euro for Animals. So we were founded in 1980, which is now 43 years ago. And really, my organization was founded uh, to end uh, life transport, at least long distance uh, life transport. And look at where we are now today, we are still facing a real uh, animal welfare crisis uh, in the EU. So it almost uh, beggars belief. Um, and as we, next slide please, as we already saw, um, NGOs have really done the work uh, for the um, uh, politicians, for the institutions. They have done so many uh, investigations over the past years and not without any results. So, um, as we said, it is very important to see an ambitious revision of the transport regulation. It's really a question whether that will happen. Um, I will come to that uh, in a moment. But we have seen in total um, 10 successful European citizens' initiatives. Um, and this is an instrument that has been given uh, to citizens uh, to make their voices heard. It's, it's one of the few uh, democratic mechanisms uh, in the EU. And out of those 10 successful uh, ECI, six were related uh, to animals. Uh, and two were very important um, at this moment. So, of course, we saw the very successful ECI and the cage age, to which the European Commission said, yes, we will ban the cages in animal farming. And then, uh, more recently, we saw a successful ECI fur for Europe asking to ban fur production and uh, imported fur products. And of course, we need to see now legislation on these bans. And that is really at stake now. We are not sure whether the Commission will still do this. Um, so it would be great to see um, a revision of the transport regulation if we get it right, if all the things that were already mentioned are included, which is very um, doubtful at this moment. But it's not enough. We also need to see, see a very strong new capped animals regulation and a new slaughter uh, regulation. So moving on, going back uh, to the history uh, of the transport regulation, here you see an overview. So this legislation has a long history and a very controversial history. So the first legislation was adopted in 1977, and then in 1991, we saw a slightly better legislation, including maximum journey times, but that was then reversed in, uh, uh, in, 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 in 2005 with the current transport regulation, where at the last minute, the maximum journey times were removed. And this can happen again at this moment. It's unbelievable to... To, to say that after so many investigations, but it's not sure that the Commission will now introduce maximum journey times. So moving on uh, to the next slide, um, millions of animals have been paying the price for this, uh, um, and NGOs have been following um, the ships and, and the lorries and the trucks, and this has really helped us to make the case uh, here. Uh, going to the next slide, we have seen so many tragedies, we don't have time to discuss them all, uh, but I think that the real, real issues with the transport regulation have, have been documented. You know, we couldn't have had seen stronger evidence. More recent um, investigations we see on the next slide. So we saw an investigation over two years from Lambs to uh, Italy. Um, uh, and as was already said, uh, these lambs were uh, transported in very overcrowded uh, conditions. There was a lack of food, uh, there was no water, there were injuries. Uh, these animals were simply not fit for transport at all. And then uh, only uh, two weeks ago, a member of the European Parliament, Niels Fugelsang, followed um, just, you know, a very routine transport from Denmark uh, to Verona in Italy. And also here, there were many, many uh, issues in these pigs were transported for breeding purposes. And the Commission is always saying, oh, you know, transport for breeding purposes, that is not a problem. So moving on to the next slide, there is a real urgent need uh, for change. 
and how should that change uh, look like? So next slide, please. Um, here, uh, I would like to wrap up the, the clear asks for the new uh, uh, transport regulation, clearly a ban on live export, because current practice has shown that it's impossible to enforce the legislation outside of the EU. In fact, the current legislation should already be enforced outside the EU, and that's simply not happening because it's impossible. So this is the only real solution. We should move to a different kind of trade. Then, of course, as Sylvia has already said, maximum journey times, eight hours for free moving animals and uh, four hours for animals in uh, containers as a rough guideline. Um, and also, we need to stop transporting uh, unweaned uh, or uh, heavily pregnant animals. This was also already mentioned. We believe that unweaned animals shouldn't be transported under 12 weeks of age. And we really differ uh, also on this uh, with the EFSA uh, opinion. Um, and then, as already was already said, maximum and minimum temperatures that are much more accurate than they are now. So, um, moving to also another solution I would like to touch upon before I finish. Um, what we are seeing now is that um, the industry is um, uh, protesting against the revision of the transport regulation. They have already contacted the Commission saying, this will cause us lots of money. If you do this, it will destroy our business. But clearly, that can't be a reason not to change it. Uh, but also, we should shift to a very different kind of trade. We should shift to a meat and carcass and genetic material trade. This is the future, and I'm pleased to announce today that uh, there will be a new uh, report on the benefits of this trade, which will show that exporting carcasses is two and a half times more cost effective than live trade, and that this shift is also much more environmentally sustainable. Uh, con contributing to ne nearly six times fewer CO2 equivalent emissions and reduced fuel consumption compared to the live trade. So this report is coming up and it will give even more ammunition to really now stop live transport. Uh, let me finish by showing you a very brief video, um, really showing why we are here today. Can we... Yeah, thank you, Renika, for this uh, strong message and, uh, and also strong images. I will end over now to Thomas, who will uh, take uh, uh, the hand to, uh, to open the floor and uh, to moderate the discussion. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of understanding, but also on comments and on, on voices uh, to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to help us here as a, as a group to, uh, to be strong on animal transport. And of course, you can ask uh, your question to, uh, to all of us here. Um, thank you. Yeah, and please feel free to do so, uh, not just ask questions. You can also give us your comments. If you give comments, please hold them uh, uh, timely and, and, and precise, short and sweet would be uh, my, my plea. Um, and, and just to, to also mention, I mean, the, uh, we, we got some presentations now that cover the main parts, uh, also the main parts of what we have worked on in the inquiry committee. Uh, uh, but... Um, in fact, there's uh, many more demands coming from this report from the Inquiry Committee uh, that is also linked because it was not mentioned to the, to the equipment, whether trucks are fit for purpose, uh, to the preciseness of regulations. So actually, customs and police uh, can actually have the legal backing to really act also uh, against wrongdoings. Um, there's clearly... Uh, one of the biggest gaps and, and loopholes is everything that is related to ship transports. This is a black hole of, of, of legality. There's no legal requirements on ships, which, which is quite awkward. Uh, there's the, the question also on which ships are actually licensed where. There's no uh, EU licensing. There's a question of blacklisting companies that uh, are, are repeatedly uh, bridging the re regulation and many more. Uh, but still, uh, please... 
come up with, with your questions to our panelists or with your comments, but if possible, keep them short. And uh, who wants to be the icebreaker? Just raise your hand and I'll hand you the floor uh, directly to Antoine. Okay, can I just add that you can ask your question in any of the language in which you have interpretation, meaning French, English, German. Portuguese and Swedish. Yes, thank you, Antoine, for mentioning. We have our fantastic translators here, uh, some of them, uh, and you have these earphones, and you can choose the language and uh, the loudness uh, on your, on your uh, desks. Yeah? It's clear for everyone? Okay. Bon. So let's see. Who wants to take the floor? Yes, sir, please. Okay. Oui, bonjour et merci. Yes, hello. Thank you for giving me the floor, Christoph Manny from the Bridget Bardo Foundation. I just wait until you got your headphones on. Yeah, I wanted to put a question to you because we're uneasy seeing that the transportation tax, despite the ambitions, is not coming out yet. I mean, as a French organization, we know that France is one of the countries blocking this. Uh, Fanoul Nadine mentioned it this morning that the red line for France was to call into question live animal experts outside the EU when we know that already we are not in a position to be able to follow the standards, uh, European standards, outside the European Union. So the current state of play of transport should be banned, unauthorised uh, transports beyond the, front, the borders of the EU. What I'd like to know, and hence I'm putting this question to you as a group, we know that Ursula von der Leyen, she didn't in fact touch on the subject at all when she gave her speech on the State of the Union, nor in a letter of intent, which is even more worrying because the priorities of the Green Deal uh, aren't then covering the issue of animals. We all know why. And we know, all know that she wants to get a second mandate and therefore she's got to get the support of the EPP and hence Mr Weber's support, who's not hidden his uh, animosity towards the Green Deal. So uh, is that something that would then allow the EPP to dictate? Could you as the Greens, as a group, say that she will not be able to count on the Greens if she uh, betrays the Commission's word? Because the Commission had made headway on revising the animal welfare uh, legislation. Is there a possibility that the group can make it known that they uh, will not support her if she stands for re-election? It's a political question, but I think in, in real terms it may uh, explain some of the blockage that's there. I can maybe start? Or yes, I would hand over this question to, to Tilly, maybe, as a representative. So, uh, la question, je vais répondre en français, si vous... I'll take it in, in French, if I may. Well, indeed, the question of the next president of the Commission will be up to the new MEPs in the new Parliament. So even if our group were to say today, listen, uh, we'll not support you if you put forward your name for a second term of office, it's, that's not the juncture when we can actually broach that. We as a group are not in favour of blackmail, of course, we're happy to exert pressure. We've written to the Commission, we've written a letter. With the Eurogroup, uh, there are other associations on board. We've exerted pressure. There's a demonstration yesterday in front of the Commission. So we are applying pressure. And I'd say it's very important that it's a cross-bench approach. It's not just the Greens applying pressure, because when it comes, I'd love us to be the biggest group. At the moment, maybe we're fourth. I hope we'd stay there. Um, but I think, first of all, you have to have a cross-bench approach. Secondly, I think, to be frank, we have put pressure on the two commissioners where we've posed the questions to Shevchevic and Hoekstra, above all to Shevchevic. We've put exerted pressure to say, listen, you're going to have to come up with the goods now. So we've exerted pressure. But in toying with blackmail is not really something we tend to do. But I'll, I'll pass the floor to other Greens if they want to take the floor. Maybe now's not the time. I'll also answer in French. It's a very relevant question. We've 
sent around letters. We signed them as members of the European Parliament, and we're trying to push this issue forward during this legislative term. We did have these candidates that were up for office. We had to confirm them. This was a precondition, and I would be so bold as to say that this was one of our key pushes, really, they needed our support. They needed us to vote for them. So we were very serious in this, and we were also quite disappointed that the Commission President's letter didn't refer to this matter. So when we come back to this debate, I think we'll have some very strong arguments within our group, but as my colleague rightly said, it will be the next group that decides. Just one comment on generally saying no more exports outside of EU to countries that do not fully comply with EU animal welfare standards. So if a, I don't know, French farmer might move a, a cow to Switzerland, I think that shouldn't be all too problematic or from Sweden to Norway as an example, because this is European countries that apply comparable standards or even better standards uh, in the case of Switzerland than, than we have in the European Union. I think there we need a bit of differentiation. And, and when it comes to the Commission, uh, it's, it's not just uh, being coherent with what they promised, but being coherent with the policies the Commission has put forward. And if you look into farm to fork strategy, that actually talks about re-regionalization of, of value, of, of, of uh, food streams, of value streams, of value chains, uh, while limiting the transport time, as an example, to a maximum of eight hours, would actually encourage and then enable the rebuilding and reconstruction also of local slaughterhouse infrastructure, of local supply. And just one thing also to mention, what, what we have to look into is how this is related to the, the agriculture policy. Because, I mean, we have developed a system in the European Union that is basically basing a production on uh, commodities, agricultural commodities extracted from all parts of the world. Most prominent example, soy from deforested areas in Brazil importing that into the European Union, stuffing it into animals, which we then export into the whole world again. And this is the main driver and the main model in behind, which then actually results into not just mass breeding, but also mass transportation uh, on long distance. And I think in, in this combination, uh, these questions also, it would be smart to be tackled by us and always to also show the bigger picture. It's not just the question of transport. There's a bigger, bigger business interest behind that. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, uh, I, I didn't see any, anyone else than the sir now, okay, because otherwise I would try to make some gender mix, but please, sir. Yes, go. Yes. Bitte, Stefan. How far will the new EU regulation on animal transport help the situation within Germany? So from the animal husbander, the farm, to the abattoir at the moment in Schleswig-Holstein we have huge problems. In Kellerhusen near Hamburg, the abattoir gets animals from Saxony, from Brandenburg, from Weissenfels is closed down. So at least five hours um, journey in the summer when it's really hot. And then we're getting animals from Kloppenburg, which is the bastion of pig husbandry. So to what extent are there possibilities to restrict that so that we can actually bring it down to five hours? Because the veterinary office, in response to my question, said that that is okay according to EU rules. If I may, maybe hand it over to Alexander Rabic to differentiate long distance, short distance, and how... So alles, was unter acht Stunden is... Well, anything under... Eight hours is considered sh a short journey. Of course, the regulation, it's a, it's a regulation. The regulation, in terms of its legal power, it's valid across the whole of the EU. The only uh, individual implementation uh, rules where Germany can implement shorter journey times 
in the national sector, so within Germany. It can decide on that. So, I mean, also clear message, the regulation as such covers all kinds of transports. Okay, additional questions. Uh, okay, I'll take the madam first and then we'll come back to you. Oui. Oui, bonjour. Yes, thank you very much. Lydia Veljes. I work uh, at the city in the city of Marseille in the government. I've been pushing this issue and it's a very challenging one. Now on this particular point, I'm wondering how we can truly get our citizens to turn out. If we want real pressure to be exerted, we need citizens to stand behind it. And we need clearer, more accessible documentation that everyone can wrap their heads around. Maybe it could be a quiz, for example. I mean, there could be various formats, but perhaps a quiz. Did you know that transportation could take 8, 15, or 29 hours? A question like that. That might make people really think, reflect, and get citizens up in arms. Perhaps across France we could have a specific day when we're all turning out and protesting. If we really want pressure to be brought, we need to have groups of people standing behind these causes. So perhaps a quiz or something else that would be accessible to everyone would really get our population up in arms. Thank you very much for this question. Or you want to answer maybe because, I, I, I mean, animal welfare organizations, at least to my experience, are one of the best organized and, and the ones that have enormous mobilization power, uh, which, which is actually the backbone of everything what we're doing here, also here in the parliament. So maybe, maybe I would forward that question to you too. I'm happy to say something to it. Um, of course, citizens' engagement is very important, and it may not be so easy for citizens also to understand what is happening at EU level and how important the EU is for animals. So we are doing um, really, really, um, um, we are making a hard job in thinking, okay, how can we make that more accessible? And as I said, the European citizens' initiatives are a very good tool. Um, to also bring the EU closer to the citizens and give them also the opportunity to contribute to a change. And that's what we have seen now uh, six times, and that's no uh, small feat. Uh, a European Citizens Initiative, it's quite an endeavor. Uh, so, and as I said, uh, many of them are related to animals. So I agree with you, we need to keep thinking about, you know, how to engage with citizens. And also next year we will have the European elections. So, you know, I hope you will all uh, cast your vote and you will make sure that your vote will count for the animals. But clearly, we need to have many more citizens going to the ballot and really um, uh, voting for the animals at EU level. Uh, so, uh, thank you for thinking with us about that. Thank you. Thank you, Reineke. You want to comment, Sylvia? No. <laughs> no, everything said very clear. <laughs> okay. Okay, then let's move on. Yes, sir, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your in interventions. Um, I might have your question is for Dr. Rabic, maybe. As a fellow veterinarian, um, what, in your opinion and with your experience, uh, what responsibilities do you think veterinarians could or should have in uh, ensuring animal welfare during, specifically here, during transportations? And how do you think those responsibilities could be outlined in a revision of the animal legislation? Thank you. Yeah, difficult answer. When I started my studies in Vienna, studying veterinary, veterinary medicine, there was no word about animal welfare at that time, 1976. Huh? But nowadays it's, all over the population. So the system will change. But all these professions follow this Gauss curve, the curve of Gauss. So we have the good ones on the one side, the, the middle, the, and the, the better ones on the other side. So we should uh, change the thresholds so that veterinarians should uh, get more duties to watch the animal welfare situation on the farms. Yeah. Uh, and in the trade and at the abattoirs. Yeah? That could be my answer. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, I mean, just to, to reflect on the experience, uh, uh, many of us were on the way also together with civil society, and, and maybe you also want to reflect on this question, but I mean, basically, it's a, we see a lack of funding in a lot of countries, so there's just not enough veterinarians. And, and uh, it, there's an improvement, at least as I have witnessed, in the awareness of veterinarians that they have a responsibility also for animal welfare, but there's just really a lack of funding and and uh, yeah this is one of the experiences and there's quite some differences from country to country also who is actually exactly responsible as an example to stop animal transports and to check animal transports so we do not have a unified uh, strategy there in the European Union makes it more complicated you want to react also Renike or Silvia like yes please <laughs> that um, this is one of the points we want, and we were also stressing that veterinarians are not enough, but not only for the number, but for the competencies, is the police on the road are there. So if they are competent not only to stop the trucks, but also to do the controls, and they need to be trained for this in all the European uh, countries, then things would be better, because there is a huge difference in the countries where the police has competence and in the countries where there is not. Also for us, we are on the road and we see something, a violation and an emergency that needs to be solved. And in countries where there is no police competent, we cannot ask somebody to stop the trucks. So really, we, our action is limited. And we are like any individual person seeing something that, doesn't, that is not um, legal and wants to complain and it's not possible because there's nobody on the phone, nobody knows who to call, there is no vet on shift, the, the police doesn't have any idea of the issue, so. Veronica? Yeah, just to add that training should also be mandatory, you know, of the police and of vets because this is very specific. Um, and it's great that NGOs have stepped into that void, but it's also crazy, you know, that NGOs have to train the police and veterinarians in doing a proper job, whereas this is just, you know, required by the legislation. So, indeed, uh, the next legislation should also uh, tackle this uh, much better. But just to say that uh, we saw um, a leak of the impact assessment also on the transport uh, regulation, and we saw what the preferred options are at the moment from the Commission. And those are not in line with what we just recommended. So really, you know, as we said, the coming months are really crucial to make sure that member states will support it um, and that many MEPs will also call for it. Yeah, well, in, indeed, I, I participated in, in the following also um, LAMS uh, in Italy and even within countries, there's very often quite big differences between some regions that have competent authorities and others that do not. And civil society called the police and they just didn't come. And well, then I called the police and it was an uncomfortable situation for them because I'm a member of this parliament, but it shouldn't be like that, you know? But then they came and practically the veterinarian that was working with the civil society was advising the police what to look at and where the bridges are and what the articles are to actually put fines on the table. But there's also a responsibility for the commission. And the inquiry committee became visible that the Commission had zero data on how many fines are given, how many controls are given. In 20 years, they have not once asked back member states to provide them uh, information whether the regulation is applied and whether systematic breaches are actually punished. And, and this really shows a lack of attention to this topic. And, and so it's not just about bettering the regulation. We, ha we even had a certain regulation, which is far from good enough, but even this was not implemented, was not uh, pushed through, and, and member states were not, and it was not enforced in member states, so we need both. We need good legislation, and we need enforcement. Huh? Oh, yes, please, Tilly. May I just maybe add something, just testimonies also that we had in the inquiry committee. So what was said is we have not enough vets doing that job at first. They don't have the necessary training that was also said already. But also often they don't have the right 
tools. They don't have the right infrastructure to be able to do their work. I don't know whether you remember, Thomas, uh, when we saw this vet that worked on a vessel. She did not have any possibility really to help the animals. So what she did, she delivered them from suffering with a knife from the kitchen. So that's how she worked, just to, to kill them in order that they stop suffering. So... And then also remember when we were at the border, and you have to look inside the truck, uh, there was only one side, like there was a horsets, like a higher uh, chair to be able to watch into it that was not, you could not move it. So unless you have another method to really have the possibility to look inside, you the vet could only see on one side. So what I want to say, it's really also to make it a priority to finance so that the vets can do their job. And I must say very honestly, with all the misery and all the suffering, they say they also need psychological help. I was often wondering when I remember that vet that was on this vessel killed the animal by a knife from the kitchen just to deliver them from suffering. I was wondering how, how, how does she, how long can she do that? How long is a vet do, able to see all this misery or maybe it, it really gets in, unsensible at one moment just to support the, the work. So it's really, they need, they need to be, uh, you need more vets, they need to have the right training, they need to be supported financially, they need also psychological support as long as we have all this suffering that's going on there. And indeed a big part of veterinarians support our cause today. Mm -hmm. This also became clear. We have time for a very last question. I look into the audience. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Good afternoon and thank you very much for these very interesting presentations. Two remarks, if I may. First of all, it seems that we didn't discuss fish, but that's crucial, especially because regulation very rarely, or not at all, applies to fish. And labeling as well. We've talked about transportation, but it seems that transportation times for organic products might be shorter. So I'm wondering if we could hear a bit more about that. And then a comment uh, from the Marseille representative. There are some areas in France that have put together organizations to raise awareness amongst the population. So. For example, there could be some information about transportation, and the French Minister for Ministry for Agriculture has an animal welfare chair that can discuss these things. So I just wanted to mention that some such awareness raising steps are in place in some member states. Um, first of all, I mean, this first panel, we decided just to focus on transport. So labeling will not be missed out. We, we will have this in the next uh, panel. And actually, our, our main expert for uh, uh, fish, fish welfare uh, is, is Caroline Rose here in the first row. Uh, so either you take the floor or you maybe bilaterally have, have a short answer. Uh, but and, and also what is also missed Missing is all kinds of regulations on pet transport, so commercial pet transports, commercial ones, yeah, uh, and, and other loopholes. So maybe you want to have a short comment on, on other loopholes. Um, and, and then maybe, Caroline, a word on, on, on uh, fish welfare, maybe, uh, and then I would uh, ask you for some final comments. In principle, uh, vertebral animals are covered by the by the scope of the regulation one 2005, but there are no specific um, um, definitions. definitions for uh, for the transport of other agricultural animals like llama or alpaca, yeah? and this should be in, uh, included in this regulation. There is a lot of, of work which should be done, and there are proposals by run by EFSA, or um, but the, uh, the Commission. I don't know what will be the result of the Commission. Huh? So you say in general the regulation is for all animals, but it misses concrete yeah. descriptions of, of, of certain, yeah. towards certain species. That's one of the big loopholes. Maybe, Caroline, a, a word on, on fish welfare? Yes, thank you very much. I'll just add a few pieces of information. I'm also part of the Fisheries Committee at the European Parliament. We know fish are often left behind when we talk about animal welfare. Indeed, today in terms of legislation, whether it's about slaughtering animals or fish welfare in general, we have very little such legislation. Actually, we don't have anything. 
In the four years I've spent on the Fisheries Committee, we've been calling for hearings on animal welfare since the beginning of this term. We managed to have one hearing on animal welfare for aquaculture, for fish that are raised in aquaculture, and we just voted on an own initiative report on aquaculture. We wanted to bring an end to fish being raised in or rather animals being raised in cages, but what is aquaculture? Well, that's fish in cages. So we had one hearing on this. As for recommendations we've made so far in the com Committee of Inquiry, we did manage to add an aquatic animals to the text, but it's definitely quite a bit of work that lays ahead. Heineke, for some final comments, please. Yes, I would like to echo also the call for much uh, better protection of fish, who are really the Cinderella species uh, in the EU. Um, at this point, you know, the Commission is planning to make sure that the new transport regulation will also um, provide more uh, species-specific protection for, for, for fish, but clearly that's not enough. So my final uh, comment uh, would be, please, everyone, write uh, to the Commission still today and urge the Commission President and the responsible Commissioners to deliver the proposals. Please do it today. It's very important. Not, o not only transport, also the capped animals regulation and the slaughter regulation. Join our actions. It's very much needed now. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. <laughs> Sylvia, please. Take a mic. Okay, I would repeat what I already said. We need to put pressure and from all the, the different actors, of course, so politicians, um, individuals, uh, NGOs, categories also, because if, if also veterinarians would make pressure, would be nice. So, yeah, I would repeat. Use any, with creativity, any instrument, any tool, but is, is, we need to put pressure until December. Yeah, thank Not you, tonight. Sylvia. Thanks for your work. My conclusion, I come back to the, my, my very most interest, this is the ban of transport of non weaned animals. You must imagine they, um, starving from hunger is not just plain discomfort, it's a high degree of discomfort. This is suffering and you know there is a study on shifting from transport of unweaned dairy calves over long distances to local rearing and the commission uh, stipulates out of data from traces that 0.1% uh, um, um, of the consignments break animal welfare law. My opinion is 100% uh, breaks animal welfare law because the, this this non weaned calves are suffering. Yeah? So this is, there must be an end to this uh, business of transporting long um, non weaned animals over long distances. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. <laughs> Tilly, our chair of intergroup of animal welfare. If I, I will be very short, I would l just like to say, don't turn your head away, continue to look when you see animal suffering. And I want to say, and especially as I see this full room, you are not alone caring for uh, animals. So if we do it together, we can still make a lot, a lot of change, really. So don't look away, be strong, and we make the change really together. Thank you for being there. Thank you, Tilly. Thank you. <laughs> so back to Anna. So the takeaways are the pregnant and unwind animals, we want a better regulation, we need a better re regulation. The time of transport is crucial, and that's for sure. Of course, the numbers also of transported animals. We have to look to the ban of transport, of exports from transport, and also harmonize the sanction system. And the real important, we have to make sure that all this rule, when they will be there, they will be implemented properly. Thank you very much for all your takes here. Thank you very much. It's really a step to look into the animal transport to be able to change the whole system of agriculture and the whole system, how we are providing our, our food. I'm sure when you're speaking about that with a citizen out there, there's a lot of people that are not aware which suffering 
is normal behind our normal way to eat. That's not normal at all, but please take your strengths, I know you have a lot, and speak about that because we need now the maximum pressure for at least to have this regulation in December and to have concrete step in this legislation. Thank you very much. So we move on now to the next panel. So, and in the next panel, we will have Olga Kiku, Joël Moran, Olivia Maurice, Stéphanie Gislain. I will invite you to take the last picture <laughs> and to uh, take a seat back so we can continue our second panel now. So we are going to, uh, to come back to, um, to the farm to fork package that was, I think, a huge progress we had in this parliament. The beginning of this legislation period, we had the farm to fork package as for the first time, as I can remember, I had a text that really explained how um, the work of people on the ground as farmers, the consumer as the way they're eating and also uh, the animal welfare cost is linked together. And that there will be no solution for the green deal so for making our um, system more resilient, more sustainable for the generation to come, there will be no solution for um, climate um, change mitigation, no solution for better biodiversity and to have a sustainable life in Europe if we are not changing completely the way we are going um, to do agriculture and to eat. So it was a huge progress and as green, of course, uh, at the group, we had a big um, hope that at the end, uh, also the animal welfare would be take as an important part of the change of the whole cult um, cultural way we are uh, treating animals and we are eating. Um, I have to say, and we, we, we said that before, um, we had this inquiry committee on animal transport. We thought it would be the begin. And after we knew we were going to have uh, four fires, uh, four legislation to work on. And at the end, we, we waited, we waited. And uh, we, at the parliament, we don't have any initiative rights. So we, may, we tried to make a lot of, of, uh, um, of pressure. But at the end, we see in the last months, uh, a backslash here in, in the parliament uh, towards all this topic. And now we have to fight not to, to forget that it was um, a broader majority that wanted those changes. And now um, we are looking to the three other files that we saw and that we thought they will come, so that it's the welfare of kept animals. So it's a response also of a lot of demands from our citizens. It is the animal uh, welfare labeling so that we know what is in when we are consuming such products and it's also the uh, regulation and animal slaughter and killing because all these are linked together and if we're not changing the whole system uh, it will be not possible to have a better um, animal condition in Europe and so we are stepping now to those um, fire that we are expecting in this uh, in these years but we are not sure they will come we want to increase um, the pressure and I have on my side um, Olga Kiku, she's head of the Office of the Compassion in World Farming, and she will talk about um, the initiative, the Citizens' Initiative and the KHS that had moved a lot of people and that are motivating us to work every day. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here today. Um, I am going to talk about the and the cage age ECI. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, it was a an unprecedented ECI 
so far, actually up till now, it is the only ECI out of uh, over 100 ECIs that uh, have been registered and um, uh, nine, now 10 uh, with, the, with the first ECI, um, that have, uh, nine ECIs rather, that have received a, um, a response from the Commission. It is the only ECI that received a positive response on all the asks. Next slide. Uh, so, taking us back to the day when this happened on the 30th of June of 2021, uh, the Commission responded pod positively to the ECI and committed to propose a cage ban uh, for all the species listed in the ECI. It, um, it was a phase of joy. Um, it was a phase of, it, we, we were exuberant about this response. Um, actually, we were very hopeful about the future because uh, starting from uh, May 2020, when the Farm to Fork strategy was published, uh, many of us, uh, many, many citizens working on many issues, not just animal welfare, but also environment, consumer, uh, consumer rights, etc., um, we thought that this was going to be, uh, we're going to a new period, a, a period where citizens matter and their voices matter. So from, uh, we had a lot of faith in the EU, especially after this decision, uh, that finally the EU will listen to its citizens and will actually give a better life to animals um, all across the region. But also, as we all know, what happens in the EU also influences the world. Um, it's not just uh, this particular region we live in. Next slide. However, um, Soon after, we started realizing that many of the uh, files in the Farm to Fork strategy uh, that uh, they were either being weakened, there was uh, some sort of backtracking um, was starting, and we have seen this actually uh, a lot uh, lately in the, in the last few months. Um, where we are today, um, it's, it's a phase of disappointment. Um, as citizens, we feel very much let down. Um, there are many questions about um, what kind of principles is, is the EU promoting? Is it promoting EU values or is it, of, of European citizens or is it promoting um, economic interests? In regards to the and the KJH ECI, um, we are seeing, we, we see that um, things are not moving forward. There was silence, and then we heard recently about only the transport proposal, but probably a weak, very weakened transport proposal being presented uh, towards the end of the year. So this means that um, 300 million animals, at least, every year will continue to suffer in cages in, in this region of the world that supposedly has the highest standards um, in, in the world. Um, we have seen that short-sighted economic interests are, are gaining ground. The values of citizens are not reflected in the decisions uh, of the Commission. Um, therefore, we, we, as citizens, um, we are losing faith. We are losing faith in the democratic institutions. And who will gain from this? Most probably those... Uh, anti-EU voices that, uh, as we've seen, they're getting stronger all across Europe. Um, I have to say, though, that it's not just um, the issue of animal welfare that, is, um, that we are talking about here. Um, it's also the, the use of uh, the European Citizens Initiative instrument, um, which is failing, because if every single ECI out of all these ECIs uh, over the last, uh, over a decade, um, are, is not happening, um, is not being implemented by the Commission, then that means that the tool is, is we have the right to qu actually question the tool, and we have the right to actually question what is in the treaties, because this particular instrument is mentioned in the treaties. Um, therefore, we probably see um, the, the right-wing parties, actually, uh, which 
many of them uh, catered to industry lobbies um, to gain power here, to feel that they're winning. And we need to realize um, how this will affect the elections in a few months from now. Next slide. So where, where are we now and what is coming up next? Uh, the fate of the proposals is unknown, at least the other proposals, as was said uh, previously, the, the proposal on slaughter, uh, the kept animals proposal, and, and also the labeling. Um, definitely, they are delayed. Um, however, they were supposed to be out at the end of, uh, by the end of September. This did not happen. Um, and still, uh, despite the fact that uh, they were ready, they were ready to be presented. Um, something else that is not out and also is in hiding is the uh, results of the Eurobarometer study on the attitudes of Europeans towards animal welfare. Um, the results are not out. We have been expecting them since early summer. Um, and uh, we are told now that um, there's still a big question mark about this, whether they will come out with the proposals whenever the proposals are out, which who knows when that will be. Therefore, it is, uh, we can say that it is the credibility of the EU institutions that is in doubt. Um, it's not just the animal welfare proposals now, it is the ECI instrument. If the Commission does not honor its word to present um, the, a, a proposal to end the use of cages in animal farming, and there is a big uh, question about the future of, of, the, of the European Citizens Initiative uh, instrument. Um, and of course, there are other questions about what kind of EU do we want and who actually decides what happens. Is it the European Commission? Is it this House, the European Parliament? Is it the Council, the ministers, the countries? Or are we talking about some uh, specific uh, big lobby interests uh, who uh, decide what will happen in the future. It seems that the citizens are not being heard here. So we, we of course, want to change that and we will continue to fight. But um, it, it's a big question that, and we fear what, how, they, how citizens will actually uh, answer this question during the elections. Um, we hope that they do support um, those parties that listen to the citizens and not just to big interests. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Olga, also for pointing out the democratic aspect of all this and uh, how serious the uh, EU institution are or not with uh, these instruments. And uh, of course, it, uh, it, it but the question in in middle of this harsh time where we see that the conservative parties are losing ground and instead of looking what is really important for citizens and animal welfare is in each survey really important to people um, they are running after a fear of maybe few groups that see or they think that they will see their own um, um, yeah, market share may be diminished. So that's really um, a democratic uh, question. And thank you very much for uh, your remarks. And uh, we, we are going to fight, uh, of course, for the instrument as a such, but also for the Green Deal and the animal welfare. And my next speaker is Joey Moran. He is a director of the European Policy Office of Four Powers. And I'm really pleased that you join us and that you will give us um, some insights about what you're expecting um, in this period of time from the EU institution. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, fellow animal advocates, colleagues. I apologize, first of all, for this awful English accent spilling out of my mouth. I should also say fellow Europeans and brandish my Belgian ID card as some sort of proof that I'm one of you still. Um, if I can perhaps start by making a slightly uncomfortable comment. And I do so also whilst thanking our, our hosts here today, the Greens, for holding this. I think it's very, very good. The problem is that it's all too familiar, isn't it? 
We know greens are for animals, but the problem is increasingly it looks like only the greens are for animals. Where are the Christian Democrats for animals? Where are the liberals for animals? Where are the social democrats for animals? And this does to some degree bother me in a period where we are beginning to go into an election cycle and we don't necessarily want animal welfare to become the sole preserve of one group or another. It should be something that transcends political boundaries. It's something that should cross everywhere. And dare I suggest that one of the problems that has led us to the impasse that we're in at the moment is, is that often it's seen too often as the preserve of one area, the left-hand side of the parliament and not that of the right. And this is something that I think we urgently need to address, and not least because this was abjectly shown to all of us during the State of the Union address, where Ursula von der Leyen failed to mention the promised proposals that we've all been waiting for. In response to her, the group leaders, of course, all stood up and responded. Not a single one, not one, mentioned animal welfare. Where were they? And I think that this is something that I would like to hear about from some of the other colleagues in this room, because from my side, it's fine if we all sit here and pat each other on the back and, and bring our hands and say, isn't this terrible? But at the moment of truth, there was a certain degree of parliamentarians missing in action. And I'm sorry, but I don't think it's necessarily good enough. So please, 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 can we work together more? Now, turning to what we would like to actually expect from the proposals that will be forthcoming, we know that farm animals are largely neglected in the current rules that are there. Rules, by, way, by the way, that the European Commission have finally acknowledged themselves are broken and essentially not worth the paper on which they are written. And uh, this gives or should give all of us some hope and confidence that ultimately those rules will be brought forward and rewritten. What I would like to do is also to point out that for the first time we are, were, I'm not sure, we're into Schrodinger's kind of cat situation with these proposals, but we are or were on the cusp of also for the first time seeing rules for other species, species which are not farmed. And they're a little bit often also forgotten, even though they're also all around us. How many people in this room are dog or cat owners? Yeah, probably about, that's rough, roughly representative. I'm surprised perhaps it perhaps isn't slightly higher in this room. But um, we were about to see a raft of rules to finally, after many, many, many years of pushing, not only from my own organization, but from many of those on this panel for new rules to ta finally tackle the illegal trade in dogs and cats. We know that the rules that have been drafted are good and they're waiting and ready to go. And it would also be, I think, worth mentioning this would be a travesty if they were now not to go anywhere at all. And this is why one of the essential components that we should be talking about of the kept animals proposal and why we need it is to, to, to link what's going on here in these perhaps sometimes grey committee rooms to the hearts and minds of Europeans because too often we only talk about the farm animals who of course need our help as well. But my office, the office I represent, the Four Paws in Brussels, was founded back in 2007 precisely because of a lack of consideration of dog and cat welfare at EU level. And when we right are on the cusp of delivering for them, it would be a shame for that not to happen. Of course, of course, of course, the same goes for other species. We've already heard about fish, which four paws doesn't work on. The lack of paws should be perhaps a giveaway there at the moment. Um, but also in, in many, many others. For example, several species of poultry, notably turkeys. We've got the problems with sheep, dairy, cows. There are an entire slew of species at the moment in Europe that fundamentally are unprotected and unless we do something quickly, really, really quickly collectively, they're not going to be for the several years to come. We know that, Olga's just covered it, that there are voices 
pushing very, very hard against any progress in this area, and at the moment, they're winning. So my appeal, perhaps more than anything else, before we move on to questions, would be that we're only going to get there by, by reaching out to others and not perhaps talking to ourselves, to go back to the point I was making at the beginning. This is particularly pertinent with the elections in view. We are going to count on so many stakeholders to do the right thing with these elections, to showcase animal welfare as one of the big things that should be talked about. We will have a new proposal, hopefully more than one, but a new proposal on the table. But beyond animal welfare, there's also now, I think, and Olga touched on it to some degree, a, a question of legitimacy. Does the ECI do anything at all? Does it mean anything at all? And if it doesn't, that should worry civil society as a whole. It's no longer just an animal welfare problem. It's a problem for participatory democracy. So please be angry, be vocal, join us in being so. Let's not work only together in this room, but also let's work with everyone that we can find across all political families and do whatever we can in the next few days, weeks, I suspect days is more realistic, to try and ensure that we do see the rest and that ultimately we bring these vast swathe of rules that are waiting to be published there to bear and to ultimately alleviate the, alleviate the daily suffering that animals, both farmed and non-farm, suffer day in, day out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Uh, also, we are doing a lot of events as an intergroup, I have to say, but this time we wanted to uh, also maybe sometimes, um, how we can say that, like our want and, and, and take a green space for this, but because we are reaching out a lot to the other parties. But as you say, um, a lot of other parties now are becoming more quiet and quiet. And it doesn't mean that they have not strong actors mm -hmm. within uh, their group, but these actors are not allowed to be so vocal maybe that they want. So that's a good initiative. We should look for the, the personal uh, driven person in the other groups, and we are doing that. And uh, thank you for remembering us, because, of course, alone we are not enough. Thank you very much. And our, not, uh, our next speaker is Olivier Maurice. He is a European um, Affairs Officer for L214, an animal welfare organization from France. He has been involved um, to a lot of actions to document numerous breaches to the animal welfare legislation. And you will take a four and uh, um, tell us uh, your expectation at this point in history. Hello, thank you so much for this invitation. So L214, uh, it's easier to pronounce it like that, not the French way. Um, I know it can be confusing for some of you. Uh, L214 is mostly known in France for its investigation. Um, over the past 15 years, we've been able to document more um, than, I think, yeah, 150 investigations to document the, the reality of uh, slaughter of transport and of the condition of uh, rearing of animals in, uh, in France. Uh, and uh, we've been able to uh, to dig up some very gruesome images that led to societal uh, changes and sometimes changes also of the law in France. So, of course, we are deeply concerned by the situation and uh, we don't believe we can call the announcement of the revision of the transports um, only the transport part of, uh, of the raft uh, a win. Uh, we believe that if uh, the Commission does not propose the four, um, the, um, the four um, texts as, uh, as previously um, mentioned, uh, this is not a win for the animals and this is not a win at all for us. Um, and like I guess a lot of you here, we've been very thrilled uh, when we discovered the content of the draft impact assessments. Um, when, where we, we've been able to read all the ambition and to discover all the ambition of the, of the revision. And, uh, for example, the, the inclusion of the, the, phasing of, uh, the phasing out of cages, the banning of painful mutilation for, for poultry, for pigs, um, the banning of killing their old chicks, 
that also was was an ambition of the of the revision. The ban on water bath stunning for for poultry on and the ban also of CO2 stunning for pigs, which is absolutely gruesome. Um, and also the stunning of fish. So like at the beginning the revision was supposed to be so ambitious. So it's it's really uh devastating to see the situation that we are we see right now. And um, it's also quite painful to hear Ursula von der Leyen calling in a State of the Union speech for a so-called strategic dialogue on the future of agriculture in the EU. Um, when it comes to farmed animals, uh, we had very, very lengthy consultation and it is even acknowledged in the draft impact assessment that is quoted in this uh, in this slide that numerous numerous stakeholder consultation uh, were held uh, on this uh, revision. So the fact that the Commission backtracked is uh, is can be called a betrayal to uh, the billions of animals kept in farms all over the EU, and it's also a betrayal for the citizens. Uh, it's been said before that uh, a huge majority of them. Uh, support more protection uh, for the animals, uh, and this is according to the last Eurobarometer. Um, but uh, we must also acknowledge that citizens are more and more aware and informed about the truth of what happens in farms thanks to the work of whistleblowers, and know they need to be informed about what the MEPs vote for and what commissioners do or do not do for the animals. Citizens are insufficiently aware of, of decisions or votes made by their representative. We, had to, we have to let people know which group or which MEPs voted for, for example, the continuation of, green, uh, of chick grinding. Or another example, who voted against the transport of unwind calves. According to a poll in France, 82% of right-wing voters um, said they support forbidding intensive farming. It is huge. Um, and also, even bigger, 96% of them, um, they are inclined to vote for the EPP, right? You got to have that in mind. Uh, said they want to provide animals with a mandatory outdoor access. Would these people still vote for EPP if they were made aware of their votes at the European Parliament? That's an open question. About the ECI, um, Olga said, uh, told, uh, well, developed a lot, uh, so I, I won't go into the details, but just next slide, please. Um, well, I, was, uh, I wanted to, to develop more, but it's, it's not useful. Um, I just want to underline again the fact that um, it's the only uh, ECI, the, the angel of the KGH, it's the only ECI where the European Commission clearly stated that the legislation had to be reformed. And the fact that the EC would back out of its commitment to revise animal welfare legislation, it undermines the very existence of ECIs as a tool, a direct democracy tool. And it was designed by the member states in the Lisbon Treaty, so it's, it's very important. Um, and it sets a very dangerous precedent, getting EU citizens to wonder what is an ECI good for. And also, it could leave the door open to litigation. That's also an open question. Um, back to the work of L214, L214. Uh, I said that we've um, mostly known in France for the investigation, so I will um, show you... Uh, sorry, gruesome images from the last investigation we've been able to release. Uh, it was just released a few days ago. Um, this is uh, this was taken in the, in the pig farm. Uh, what you see here is firing crates for sows. Uh, the sows cannot um, flip, turn, move whatsoever. Next slide, please. Um, this is a result of um, tail docking and uh, also castration performed without anesthesia most of the time. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Um, this is also the infamous uh, farrowing crates. Next, please. And this is when the souls are pregnant, well, impregnated. Uh, this is a gestation crate and um, this is um, very common. This is uh, the crate that you can find in 95% of French farms. 
uh, which is just intensive farms for pigs. And so I believe that these images show um, the importance of this revision because um, because the Commission uh, said at the beginning that uh, it considered option to phase out the phase out these um, these cages. So thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for sharing. Even the pictures are really hard to uh, to to see and to to take away that. It's the, the main um, pictures we have, and that's uh, the point also. We every time see that industry is just lying, putting some beautiful images of uh, animals outside, but uh, the truth is not there. And we know when the truth is not um, valuable after we will have uh, difficulty to defend democracy because there is no any more confidence in um, in each other. So re really thank you for, for putting that forward. My last speaker is Stephanie Gislin. She's political affair manager of your group for animals. And uh, you will focus uh, on uh, fur free Europe and uh, let us know what, uh, where your hopes and where you stand now. Thank you for being here. No, thank you so much. Uh, I will just also focus on an ECI. And as my colleagues, I really share, you know, the, the, the strong trust we had into this instrument. And that's also why you can see that the movement has used it a lot. But it's interesting to see that out of the six successful, e 10 successful ECIs, actually six were related to animals or environment. So it really shows that it's an important tool that citizens really care about animals. And the one I'm going to talk about is not truly finalized yet because we are still expecting the response from the commission. So next slide, please. I'm just going to tell you a bit more today about why we started this ECI and then go on into some other remarks about what we see for the future and probably join my colleague a lot in what they've already been saying at this panel. So we started all together, not only Eurogroup for Animals, uh, this ECI out of the convergence of political reasons and ethical ones. As you can see, we always show this quote, and I think it's also valid for in the cage age, by the way. Every age has its massive blind moral spots. We might not see them, but our children will. Next slide. So definitely your group for animals has been working on fur animals for a long time. We are definitely convinced that there is no way those, far, those production systems can be economy, economically viable and also ensure sufficient welfare for the fur animals. So for us, the ethical case was very clear from the start. But of course, with the pandemics and other reasons came piling up and more focus was put on this production because we also we all noticed that most of those production got closed because of public health reason. It's so intensive that of course those farms become a place where the viruses, the virus outbreaks are very common and we saw it recently as well with avian influenza. So the, a lot of focus was put on fur farms back then and so all the reasons started piling up. It has a lot of environmental consequences too. There's no real economic case for this sector with the pandemic. Most of them, most of the countries actually closed the sector and it was fine actually. So it's a decreasing sector as well. And it's not an essential product for, to be honest. Next slide. So just for the ones who are not familiar with this ECI, it concerns mostly animals that are only raised for fur, and these are wild animals in most cases, so mink, foxes, and raccoon dog. I'm not going to show videos uh, because they are terrible, but so the situation on the, on the farms are very difficult, and there's a lot of science to show that it's impossible really to guarantee their welfare in those conditions. At the moment, we will see it later, the only housing system that exists for those animals are very small cages, wire mesh cages. So as I said, it's the convergence of ethical environmental reason with, of course, political reasons. It's always very difficult to make something happen in the void. And at the moment when the pandemic was putting the spotlight really on the fur farms, what happened is also that the farm to fork strategy was announced and thus a revision of the animal welfare legislation. And thus far as it became clear that this was the opportunity to make something happen for fur animals at this time. Next slide, please. So 
it became clear that we had a bit to align our timeline in terms of the ECI with what was going to happen, hopefully, with the European Commission. So as you can see, it was a very successful ECI. It started on day first by collecting 50k, signa we can come back, yeah, 50K signatures. And it's interesting to see in a country where there is still fur production, like Finland, they got over what we call the threshold in the first day. So the threshold is the needed signature in order to validate the ECI in that country. So it's very interesting to see that. And then six months later, we already had one million signature, not yet authenticated, of course. And then roughly after nine months, we closed the ECI with 1.7 million signature initially, and then one, more than 1.5 after authentication. And we did that not after 12 months, also to fit the political agenda. Next slide. It's very interesting to also explain to you that this is a, a call that we have, which is, to be fully clear here, it's a ban on the production in the EU, so we want fur farms to be banned in the EU, but we are also looking at imports, because if we just if we don't do this, then it will simply be replaced by products that we get from other countries. So this, these were the main cause of the ECI. And since we've been working on all this, at the moment we can say that already 20 member states in the European Union actually have some kind of ban, a partial or a full ban, on those fur farms in different ways. But this makes a lot of country out of 27. So it's a long, um, if, if we look at it from a single market perspective, it's also very fragmented and it's not very easy. And of course, in June, we also saw a vast majority of countries calling for a ban at the EU level at the occasion of an agri-fish council. So, of course, with the process going on at the Commission in terms of revising the legislation and the momentum with the ECI, the momentum with the member states, we really believe the time is now. Next slide. As I just wanted to point out, as I mentioned, in this ECI, it's not only about banning the production in the EU, it's also about what we called, in a very bad jargon, banning the placing on the market of all of products related to fur farms, regardless of their origin, so also products that are coming from other countries. The EU mostly import from Russia, China, and from the US. And as you can see, the situation for animals is the same everywhere in the world. And very often we tend to believe it's going to be better in the EU, but it's exactly the same. So just to show you, it's very similar. Next slide. You can go next. This is also to show you support for, for, for this. So when it comes to, to what we could do now, I, I can only echo what my colleagues have been saying about working with other groups, because indeed we, have, we are very appreciative of the work of the Greens. But it's true that at the moment we need to build even more bridges. With the Soteu speech, indeed, we're a bit disappointed. But of course, the hearing of uh, the candidate Sefcovic showed that uh, several groups at least question uh, this issue. And that was very good. And I, I really believe that we will, I hope the House can continue to call on this. Next week, there's going to be a plenary where you have, there's two occasions actually to raise this topic. You might know there will be a debate on the work program. We don't know yet what's going to be in the work program, but we are all expecting to see transport and that's it. So that's an occasion to complain. And then also for the ones who do not know, there's also a debate on the Fur Free Europe initiative on the Thursday morning. And this is also an, an occasion not only to call and to support, we hope, the call of Fur for Europe, but also use this opportunity to call for the proposals. Because from a completely political perspective, this is technically a topic that could be handled in the kept animal regulation. Olga has made the point about the cages. How can we then keep cages for wild animals and on fur farms? So this is really something that should be also taken care of within the, con the context of the kept animal regulation. So, my cause to you is exactly as my colleagues, do build bridges with other groups, try to bring some more in so that at least there is a debate, a strong debate, a strong positive voice during that debate on Thursday, even better try to get a resolution because the resolution we have on and the cages, it's a very strong tool to talk to the Commission. This is also something we would need for Fair for Europe and continue to push for the delivery of the kept animal regulation and also the slaughter regulation, the rest of the package, basically. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm sorry. I think we can end up uh, with, a, with a video that we, we had planned. I forgot because it was not in my slide deck. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we can finish with that.
Friends, for over 40 years, the EU has taken legislative and non-legislative steps to improve animal welfare. But science has evolved during that time. It is telling us that we need to do more. Do more. Do more. Do more. Our goal, Our goal is to reconcile, reconcile the economy with our planet, planet to, to reconcile, reconcile the way we produce, the way, way we consume with our planet, and, and to make it work for our, our people. If it matters to Europeans, it matters to you. My congratulations go to the organizers of the NWHA initiative for this major achievement. Speaking to both Ursula von der Leyen promised us when she was asking for our trust. Standing still is falling back, falling back, falling back. So we've been fighting for this deliver the proposal for many weeks now. Um, thank you very much for this uh, uh, video because it was, I think, a perfect summary of uh, what has been said. I will open now for the last 20 minutes of the first uh, round of this um, event, the room for questions and comments. And please um, don't hesitate to speak also your mother tongue if you wish and uh, to give some comments, um, some question, even precise questions to somebody or just uh, for the whole room, please. Thank you, Anna. As Joe Sway from Humane Society International Europe, um, thank you all for your, your presentations uh, this afternoon. Um, I think some excellent points were made with regard to the, the fact that what has been happening with this Citizens Initiative and the failure to deliver uh, on the, the ECIJ and the cage age is a threat to participatory democracy. My question to the panel so far, and also to the green the representatives of the green group here as well, is what steps have been taken or are you considering to take um, to actually unite with other civil society organizations in this regard? And how could the green group actually help with this? Because this is not just, as I've said to many people, something that should be of concern to us as a bunch of bunny huggers and tree huggers. It's not just the animal organization this concerns. It's actually a principle of democracy, which is rendering the ECI as an instrument to be an empty box if we don't get action on it. I'd very much like to hear from you guys about this. Thank you. Thank you. I can try to, to, um, to answer. It's not so easy. We have, of, of course, the, the parliamentarian intergroup where we are in connection with other, with other parties. And uh, we are really aware that it's not only um, a Green Deal perspective, but also a democracy one. Uh, 
Um, we are joining now and we will uh, have, uh, at least in the German-speaking area, a big press release tomorrow because we have, at the end, some survey that is proven how people are voting here. So we are going to push for that, that it becomes really known that what the people are saying and what they're doing here in the parliament is not the same. So we have really to be clear on these figures. Uh, we will push for that. And uh, of course, an event like today is also, and um, we will have a, a good 30-minute uh, breaks after so that you can connect together and maybe exchange what you're doing in your countryside, what it's working um, in these um, times, I have to say, where the public attention is maybe somewhere else and is it understandable in a way. So how we can um, um, rely uh, on each other to, uh, to, make this, um, to make this battle really, really uh, meaningful uh, till, the next, uh, uh, till the next months and also till the next election. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your comment. And please, Olga, step in. Yeah, uh, just a quick comment that um, pro-democracy groups are actually uh, taking, have taken notice here and they are um, also uh, starting to engage and they're mobilizing and uh, they are planning a number of actions and I will, uh, I will let them speak for, for, for themselves. But um, uh, we are really thrilled that they're joining this fight because it is about democracy. Um, I would also like to uh, remind everyone, or although many of you may not know yet, but tomorrow is the World Cage Free Day and we are planning a number of online actions and it would be great if also um, our, our members here, MEPs, um, also participate in these actions because it is important that our message is heard. Thank you. Thank you. Took note. I have a next question here. Ja, hallo, mein Name ist Jens Hübel. Ich uh, I'm a vet from Germany. I'm going to do this in German. Uh, it'll just be easier for me than trying to struggle in English. Two points. First of all, we've heard a lot about what's possible or what can be expected doesn't actually turn up. Of course, the focus here is perhaps on what remains by way of possibilities without uh, forgetting the fact that they're, we're hoping something will come up on transport by December and then we've got the end the cage age and other plans. So uh, how can we try and get more focus on this? And then the regulation 625 from 2017 that says clearly that measures have to be effective. Sanctions have to uh, work as uh, putting people off committing any breaches. So I think we need to raise the point that the existing legislation, the rules and regulations, haven't been implemented properly as yet. So we need to improve things, but what we already have is not being implemented. And so maybe to those parties who are always in favour of uh, law and order, and saying we have to keep to the laws, well, let's tell those friends, well, listen, uh, you know, that applies everywhere, not just uh, for the ones you want to choose and not for the others. So that's one point that I think is important. The second point is EU checks. Audits in countries take place where the implementation has to be justified, it has to be checked. But in general, nothing really happens. They have a look, a few statements made, and in general, everything's deemed to be OK. And the second point that I think is important, turning to the issue of the Green Group, the Green Party, in the 2000s, there were fantastic electoral campaign posters, which were so good, people had them in their rooms, because they were creative, they were funny, and people just thought they were good fun and in enjoyable. And my appeal is to do that this time as well, to try and link into that, pick up on topics and, and posters. For example, animal protection issues should be put, picked up as active topics for going on the hustings, active topics for the electoral campaign, be provocative, uh, interesting, um, you know, not offending people, but just 
packaging our idea so that people talk about what we're doing and people say actually we find that quite interesting you know it's one thing hanging them in up in a room but it's taking them with you if you like so these are topics that people talk about and take away with them uh, and so animal welfare should be one of those issues that are used in the electoral campaigns Danke für Thanks very much for those two important points. Two other um, questions and remarks, and after I will close and we will try to make an a, a answer round and summary, because at half past we have uh, a break with a translation and we should uh, go to our um, photo group action that we planned. So um, I've seen here, it's your round. Merci. Thank you very much. I'm a councillor and work on a council of a town, town council. Now, we're all going to have to work together for this big job of work that we're faced with on the possible effectiveness of our requests. I mean, we several of us who have a delegation who can request things of a town. Can we work together on one particular wish where anybody who wants to be on, on board, all the mayors, for example, in France, in Europe, would that be an efficient measure if all of us at the same time put in this request? Um, which we can be creative, but it can be very similar in nature. I had um, here beside a question, yes. <coughs> oui, merci de... Yes, thank you for giving me the floor. Maybe I've missed something. Uh, I wasn't here all the time, but I didn't hear anybody mention from the very start uh, the abuse of animals through poisoning. Maybe I missed it. Why am I speaking about that? Well, quite simply because today I'm, I'm a deputy mayor in the seine et part of France and I'm responsible for nature in, in the towns. And one of the issues that we're trying to pick up on is all the relations there are between agriculture and biodiversity around us. And I don't know what link you make between those responsible in the committees and the commission. But, for example, a lot of pollinators and here I include birds, but also insects, and certain mammals as well, who've become victims of pesticides and phytosanitary measures. And when we note that the European Commission is going to extend the use of glyphosate, the, the approval of the glyphosate uh, being used, I'm just wondering uh, what's happening. You know, Are you going to be in a position, I mean, maybe you are taking action to exert pressure on the Commission President to prevent this, uh, what should I say, this extension of the use of glyphosate. I mean, uh, the more besides, of course. Um, it was something that I thought was important when we're talking about abuse of animals. Uh, poisoning is also part and parcel of that. Oh, no, we didn't talk about that today, that's right, because we were concentrating on the topics that we are expecting to, to come up. But I can come back to you on that. One last question, and then we'll summarise. Yes, that would be one of the points that we move away from CO2 stunning in pig farming because they suffer terribly when they're shoved into these uh, stunning pens. This happens every single week. And in uh, abattoirs, people tell me at least 10 or more. And this is the, the, the slaughters themselves are saying that these animals are not unconscious at the time. Then the question of mobile abattoirs. A lot of vets 
here in Schleswig-Holstein, for example, they deal with it this way, but others deal with it in a different way. There seems to be a lack of clarity. Some vets say even uh, as long as I'm a vet here, until I um, go take my retirement, there won't be any mobile uh, slaughterhouses. Then we've got the trade agreements that are coming up, Mercosur, for example, New Zealand as well, where certain products are going to be covered. We have to make sure that animal protection standards are valid throughout, both for imports from Brazil, where the slaughtering conditions in slaughterhouses are horrific, much worse than in Germany. Thank you. So I have now a real big bunch of questions. So we had the question about how we can uh, do law and order in the um, uh, animal welfare legislation we have already now, how we can uh, find some uh, partners on that and to have really uh, EU control audits, um, creativity uh, doing campaigning. Uh, we had this question, we had the how can uh, act the cities and uh, how can they formulate their wish towards um, animal welfare and uh, uh, all the topic on uh, glyphosate and sustainable use of pesticide, but that would be a little bit too broad, I think. Uh, also, the uh, Mercosur and New Zealand um, free trade agreement, it's uh, really broad. So I'm sorry, uh, I think we, we, we can maybe have a few words, but uh, it's really a, a broad topic. And we have the, um, uh, the concrete question on the slaughtering with CO2, that it's really painful and also uh, yeah, the mobile and the local uh, possibility to do a, a more um, small-scale uh, slaughtering. So I will, you, you, you told me you have a lot of uh, answers, so I give you the floor. I'm happy because then I can pick what I answer and then my colleagues can do the rest, right? Um, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm a trade geek. I used to, uh, to lead the trade program at Eurogroup for Animals. So on Mercosur and <laughs> on New Zealand, I can definitely reply to you that this is a problem. Eurogroup for Animals and, and its members, have been, we've, been, we've been fighting to get conditions in what we call market access provision. So basically trying to get that if countries have it's easier for them to export to us animal products then they should at least respect similar standards as those applied in the EU. But of course, it's limited what you can do with this. So the next step is definitely to get import requirements in this new legislation. I will stop there. Don't worry. And then the other one I, I'm, I would prendre avec plaisir, c'est la question sur les... I'm happy to cover the question about the wishes for uh, cities and towns in France. Uh, well, having a some sort of organized approach around the elections is a good idea. Uh, maybe coordinating some sort of campaign. What do you think would be good? What, what do you think a message would be that you could be on board with? There may be a certain number of commonalities that we can work with. I'm happy to work with you on that. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that very quick and comprehensive answer. Olivier. Merci pour toutes vos well, thank you for all the questions. Very interesting. I'll reply in French. First of all, on an issue concerning respecting legislation that's been promulgated by the Commission, I'm looking here at Caroline, where we work together. Uh, the transport of turkeys, for example, it says that they have to be kept in a position which is natural, there shouldn't be obstacles, about 30 centimetres high in France when you're transporting turkeys. They can't move. They're completely squashed in. So you could, we've noted with uh, Caroline on the ground that this happens, and these are breaches and flagrant breaches. We've addressed the Commission with a formal complaint, and the answer is you cannot say this is a general situation. That was an individual one-off case. Uh, well, you know, we do see a lot of them at... Uh, uh, at, in my organisation, L214. Now, the regulation is a bit woolly, it's a bit vague. Um, if you're talking about centimetres, one thing, you've got the national authorities who have to act. Uh, we think this is ridiculous. The, the rules aren't maybe satisfactory per se, but you can't say that they are that vague. It seems that the, the Commission is uh, abdicating responsibility on this. Oui, Caroline, je t'en prie. Yes, Caroline, go ahead. Yeah, just to add looking at uh, f following on 
the uh, investigation we had on the transport of turkeys. I went to the ministry and when we showed the article of the legislation from 2005 on the size of cages, uh, I was told by the ministry in France that the um, actual measurements were not included in the text and everybody's free to interpret it the way they want and that's how well it is. <laughs> Well, it's outrageous. Sorry, Joe. The floor for uh, any question or any end remarks? Uh, yeah, actually, and I, I must just say, I um, thank the gentleman over there. But, um, Entschuldigung, uh, mein Deutsch ist nicht so gut. Sorry, my German's not so good. I'll have to speak in English. Your, your comments, I think, went to the heart of the matter that I was touching on earlier on. My worry is there's not a lot that we can do right now, hence why perhaps we're talking about the medium term. We've got days, and I really mean days, I think, in order to try and get more than, we've co than we're have than we currently going to get. Otherwise, we are looking at the elections. And the elections are, to my mind, the single biggest weapon that we've got here in terms of ensuring that we get something next time and that ultimately that the citizens' initiatives are honoured. And the reason is that it's the one time every five years that the power comes back to all of us in this room. If we can't use it then, we're doing something wrong. So we should be making sure that animal welfare as a concept is right up there with all of the other things that are going to be talked about. Whereas before, that's never been the case. It's been missed at every single turn. It's been everything else but animal welfare. Now it should be forefront. The other thing I will say is, at the end of that process, the groups in this house get to say what their priorities are for the following five years. We trust, obviously, that the Greens will have animal welfare in them, but we also should be demanding that other groups do the same. And when those commissioners designate sit in places like this and answer questions from newly elected MEPs about what they're going to be doing, my goodness, not a single one should be approved by this House unless a promise is extracted from them, if needs be written in blood, to make sure that, we, that, that they do what they, they have committed to do and honour the European Citizens' Initiative. On the, the rule of law, I completely agree with what you said as well. Um, the Commission is very, very fond at the moment, rightly so, of perhaps lecturing others on the rule of law. I would simply say, surgeon, heal thyself. Thank you. Um, last remark from Olga. Okay. Um, just, just in closing, at least from my side, um, I'm not going to refer to animals. I think everybody in this room understands the suffering and everybody wants the suffering to end. I am going to talk though about democracy, I am going to refer to, to the democracy um, element of all this with the European Citizens Initiatives, but also the, the multitude of studies and uh, consultations and interviews that there have been, taken place already. And um, I, I, I just want to say that um, I think the EU, the, the European Commission, and also the parties that support those special interests and not the interests of citizens, do not really comprehend how much damage they, they, they do to the, um, the institution of democracy in the EU. Um, it's, uh, the, the, I was, um, um, a few months ago, I was uh, talking to someone who was uh, in um, uh, the president's um, uh, team, and um, it, was, it was interesting because they told me when I was telling them about animal welfare, the, the answer was that, well, um, the, the anti-EU voices are actually saying that uh, we have too many regulations, etc., so we don't need more, etc. Well, I'm going to say exactly the opposite, that but um, we are pushing people to, to have complete, I mean, to lose, basically we're push, pushing people to lose faith. And people who lose faith lose interest. Therefore, that, that means that in the upcoming elections, we may not have all these voices that matter, all these people who do want to um, uh, support um, animal welfare and support all these issues that we all support. But... We will lose these people because they may not even go to vote. 
And that means that those, those anti-EU voices will gain power, will gain strength, because others are disinterested and lo they lose interest in the EU. So I think this is the big danger here, and that is what the Commission ought to realize. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Big applause. I hope... I hope you had the last word because the translation ended uh, at uh, half past, but uh, your words were really clear. I think we all could uh, follow this. We are doing now um, a break. We are doing a photo action at first, and after we have a half an hour break. At uh, 5 p.m., I will hand over to Caroline and to Francisco for the next part where we are going to have presentation of wonderful initiatives that are really um, uh, in the several uh, topics, several countries. Thank you very much and come for it here. We are going to make a big photo together to uh, show our strength. Thank you very much for your participation. Yeah.